Welcome, as always, to everyone tuning in tonight on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, I am joining you from Ottawa, the traditional unceded and currently occupied territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And I'm very glad to be joined, as always, with, uh, by my co-host, Libby Davies, for tonight's Off the Hill political panel. Hi, Robin, and hello to everyone who's tuning in this afternoon and this evening. I'm joining the panel today from the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people, the Coast Salish, Salish people, uh, also Vancouver. So tonight our panel was supposed to be focused on the upcoming federal budget, and we are still going to get to that topic. But of course, events in Ottawa here and across the country with the so-called Freedom Convoy have overtaken much else. Uh, we have been promoting this panel as whose budget is it anyway? But I think uh, the question on everyone's mind right now after two weeks of occupation in Ottawa is whose city is it anyway and who's making the decisions? So to help us uh, unpack that, tonight we have uh, Elle Jones. Welcome back, Elle. Elle is a uh, poet, journalist, professor, and activist living in Halifax. She's also chair of the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners Subcommittee to Define Defunding the Police. Uh, welcome back, Elle. Uh, Leah Gazan joining us again. Welcome back, Leah. Leah is the MP for Winnipeg Center and the NDP critic for children, families, and social development as well as the Deputy Critic for Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. And David McDonald, uh, welcome David, joining us. Uh, David is the Senior Economist for the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and author of The Alternative Budget. And uh, one of our regular panelists, Carl Nuremberg. Uh, welcome Carl. Carl's an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and filmmaker who works in both English and French. He is Rabble's Senior Federal polit Politics Writer. Uh, welcome to all our panelists and uh, welcome to all of you watching on Zoom. Uh, please participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function and we'll do our best as always to address your questions. And for those watching on Facebook, welcome, including hopefully my dad, hey dad. Um, so, uh, so we're going to begin our panel tonight looking at the responses to the so-called freedom convoy and panelists, I, I invite you to jump in on each of these questions. The, so this convoy came to Ottawa under the guise of opposition to a vaccine mandate for truckers. They traveled across the country, gaining support from a variety of sectors with supposedly similar grievances. And they got huge media attention along the way. What also got media attention, however, is how the convoy has been impacting the residents of downtown Ottawa, as Carl's, Carl and others have written about. The disruptions, the violence, the hate-filled slogans, the harassment, the military-like organization, all raise the question, who is really behind this occupation? And importantly, why have the authorities been so passive and inept in their response? Elle, you recently released a groundbreaking report on defunding the Halifax police last month. Um, has the response by the authorities in Ottawa changed or affirmed any of your views on defunding the police? Thank you, Robin. Well, you know, my mother, first of all, who isn't, you know, necessarily in tune with all of my politics, I was speaking to her the other day and she was like, oh, they should just defund the police. Like, they can't, you know, the police are useless. So many people have been saying the Ottawa police have been staging one of the most effective commercials to defunding the police that we've ever seen. Um, but I think what we have to do for those of us on the left is I think we have to be really careful about how we engage with discourse around state violence and state force. Right, because part of what we're always trying to build is a world that moves beyond the idea that our only solution is force and violence. So this has been the dilemma, right? Because on the one hand, of course, we recognize that this is a white supremacist convoy, that there's, we're seeing swastika flags, we're seeing um, all kinds of violent slogans. We've seen members of the far right out. Um, of course, we've heard the stories of like the soup kitchens and shelters and places that are being intimidated and threatened. So we know that this isn't the worker uprising that people are trying to sell this to as, and we know it's extremely dangerous. And of course, we also have been through all the discussions around all the ways that the police have suddenly forgotten to do all the things that they do when Black and Indigenous people are peacefully protesting. So when youth in Vancouver were protesting, I think it was for climate change, within 48 hours, the city of Vancouver had an injunction that said you couldn't be on any stairs and sidewalks when they wanted to be outside of the legislative building. We've seen injunctions passed 
for indigenous people on their own territories protesting uh, for water defense. We've seen all kinds of laws and cracking down. In August 18th, for example, in Halifax, the police came violently and cleared a shelter, which included um, pepper spraying an 11 year old girl in the face on Spring Garden Road, which is downtown. And all of this was to get rid of two shelters that unhoused people were using. We've experienced that across the country as well. So in fact, in the last two years, we've seen a huge crackdown on protesting for indigenous people, for black people, for people defending the unhoused. We had the youth in Hamilton who were arrested simply for defending an encampment. And then all of a sudden that violence Oh, well, we don't know what, not only is it not violent, but they're like, we just, we don't know how to get people to stop honking their horns. We don't know how to get a, a truck to move. We just, we don't know, what do we do? And, and this kind of performance of helplessness, we know never exists when black in, and indigenous people in particular, or workers or unionized workers, whoever it is, go out and protest. But I think where some on the left are going wrong is people like, why won't the police do their jobs? And I think they are actually doing their job. This, this is what the police do. The police exist to get indigenous people off their lands, defending capital, defending the oil and gas money and criminalizing indigenous people as a result, because we know indigenous sovereignty is the greatest threat to capitalism and to money. The police exist to oppress black people and keep us in the unhuman and stop us from being part of public space. The police exist to arrest and criminalize drug use, to arrest and criminalize sex workers, to arrest and criminalize people with mental health. All of those who are seen as not conforming people who do not conform to this norm, that is what the thin blue line is. That's the literal image that they have, that there's chaos. And the only thing standing between chaos and white order is the police. So what are they doing right now? They are upholding the white order. There is no social threat to the Canadian order in this protest. If they were actually unifying workers, it would be done. When did Martin Luther King get shot since we're in Black History Month? Martin Luther King got shot when he organized sanitation workers in Memphis and he connected the racial struggle to the class struggle. When did Fred Hampton get shot? When Fred Hampton as a 21 year old young man organized people of all different racial and class backgrounds and was creating a coalition and the FBI moved in. So we know that this convoy is not a worker uprising or about unity or freedom because it was about the true expression of those things. It would have been stopped that it actually is no threat to the Canadian social order, that many of the police, as we know, are in favor of this and support it, that it upholds white male rage about the changing social order and the idea that they no longer have the same kind of powers. In fact, they do, but they believe they're being eroded because some black person got hired once somewhere or there happens to be an indigenous MP or some woman, you know, got a job. So, oh, no. So I think we also have to be honest with ourselves about what the police do. And this is what the final thing I'll say is this is what leads us to the defunding conversation is when we talk about defunding, it's really the first time in a long time on the left, usually we've left like finances to the right, you know, the idea that the right is like fiscally responsible and the left spends money. And we always have that myth that we kind of allow. And often we've Focus on the social, not defunding the police is really put like the economic order front and center and the idea that we pay for what we value and that societies, the budgets that we have reflect power in society. And of course, we've been shifting money to policing and punishment for decades to uphold the very social order that we are observing in occupied Ottawa right now. So if we ask ourselves, why can't the police do something? Because they are not designed to do this because they have no will to do it. And because this actually is their job to allow this to happen. And I think the sooner in many ways that we recognize that, the more productively we can start to have a conversation about why we continue to believe that policing and punishment is any kind of social solution that's ever upheld any of us. And of course we saw in Vancouver, they didn't need the police. People on bicycles stopped them because community came out and was able to do what the police have not been able to do anywhere, which is stop this. So we got a demonstration that people who are unified, that are building coalitions are still the most powerful force. And I know that other people living in Ottawa have a bit of a different view because you're like living with these people. And when there's no solution, it's like, what do we do but try and get laws passed? But I think what it has done is sort of set a crossroads for the left around how we build coalitions, how we organize, and how do we move away from relying upon narratives of state violence when we see exactly what the combination of white supremacy and state violence actually looks like. It looks like downtown Ottawa. Let me, um, I want to uh, see if other panelists want to make a comment, but I want to just give a little um, background about uh, specifically in, in Ottawa, right, just to get, just to put this into context, right. So there was, um, 
<coughs> sorry, a couple of years ago, there were um, black, young black and indigenous folks who blocked one intersection for three days following the uh, acquittal of a police officer in the killing of a black man. The, the police, despite being in contact with the organizers, right, and we're talking to them on like a Friday evening, and they knew th that the young people had a meeting arranged for the next morning, right, that would likely end the protest, came in at three o'clock in the morning, violently by the, 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 the reports of some of the pro protesters, and arrested and charged 12 of them. And I think that was like half, right? So, so there's a, so the, that, this, this is in Ottawa also, so there's a contrast there. But, um, were other folks wanting to, um, um, well, Robin, oh, I, if I could just um, sort of build on what um, Elle is saying, I think mm. part of the question that we're trying to unpack here as well is who's really behind this occupation. So I think um, you've done a really great job, Elle, of talking about sort of the historical and current context in terms of who the police are and what they represent and what they defend. But I think there's also a very big question um, in terms of the organization behind this rally. It was not a rally, uh, occupation. It was not random. It was not, you know, sort of here or there. It's highly orchestrated. It's very sophisticated. There's now information that um, our C former RCMP officers are involved. So anyone sort of care to make a comment okay, on uh, that in terms of what's behind uh, the organization and, and this rally and why that's so problematic? Carl. Maybe I'll just jump in quickly. If, if I would say people listening, if you look up a, uh, a group that calls itself policeonguard.ca, so it's one word, it's policeonguard, all one dot CA, uh, and they talk about their big supporters of this, open supporters, and they're a group that includes actual working police officers and retired police officers, and they're very much totally behind this uh this this event uh they say in solidarity and the cbc has done some fairly good reporting where they had a bunch of names of actual people including one of the main organizers um who was on at one point on the prime minister's security detail and he was a sniper they call him his role was to be a sniper to shoot somebody who got in, who might be in danger to the prime minister and then it, apparently he didn't want to get vaccinated so he lost his job and he's very uh bitter and uh, so he's joined this this uh this group um there's as well um the issue that from the outset, the, 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 the body language you're getting from Chief Peter Slowly of the Ottawa Police, and you know, the Ottawa Police hired a chief of color, uh, originally with the Toronto Police, to bring in somebody, supposedly, to make peace, uh, to, to continue to uphold the interests of the police and the interests of policing, but to make peace with communities of color in Ottawa after the horrend horrendous stuff that happened. I mean, the, the, the murder of, of an innocent uh, Somali person by a policeman happened very close to where I live, by the way. And it was, you know, the guy was just, he just beat, he beat him to death. He was, a, he was a mentally ill person. And um, so what, you know, what we have is you have this chief of police acting from the beginning as though, like, terrified, terrified of doing anything. And many people were commenting right from the outset, there's a strong impression they have that he's a general whose uh, troops would not follow him into battle, that the large proportion of the Ottawa police, sir, you know, the active members of the force might have a, lot, a st strong uh, measure of sympathy with these, uh, with these uh, so-called protesters, and he couldn't get them uh, to act in any way. Also, apparently, he knows, uh, Peter Slowly, that they're very well armed. They don't just come to a peaceful demonstration to behave peacefully. They have these huge trucks. They're full of all kinds of stuff. They're very well armed. And as well, they've got another secret weapon, these demonstrators. I wonder if, Brianne, you could put up the photograph that somebody took today, not in Ottawa, but in Windsor. Uh, this is a photograph that somebody posted just today um, who was at the demonstration in Windsor um, of people using... It's a small one, so it's going to be hard to see. You see what you see there? Read Bridge to USA. That's in Windsor. Look who they're using. Look who they're using as human shields. They're children. They're using their own children to uh, uh, block uh, people from using the bridge in Windsor. Maybe you can put up the other picture, uh, Brianne, just to okay. show you their talk. Yeah. 
Um, Carl, while while Brienne is doing that and we're looking at that, I I also want to bring okay. it back now to um to what's gone on on Parliament Hill and turn right. to Leah because obviously Leah, you've been there and we know that uh, at the beginning of the week, uh, the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh called for an emergency debate in Parliament, and that actually did take place. Uh, we've seen the stories on that. And his call for an emergency debate was on the convoy crisis affecting people across the country. He's asked the Prime Minister to show leadership to put uh, an end to the convoy, to investigate the funding. That's a very big issue, this uh, 10 plus million dollars that's funding the convoy and to work on a plan to get Canadians through the pandemic. So just interested in your take, Leah, in what was the tone of that emergency debate? Um, uh, because we know that the Conservatives, many of them have been, uh, you know, showing their solidarity with what's happening on the street. Um, yeah, uh, so very, very interested to know how you saw that emergency debate and what came out of it. Well, I think it's really important to first to recognize this is not a protest. This is a this is an occupation that has been well orchestrated and funded by alt right fascists uh, from the United States. Uh, we saw, for example, uh, GoFundMe uh, raise over ten million dollars uh, in eight uh, days, and this is what they do. Uh, we are at a time in history where we're in deep recession. Uh, people are struggling, and this is what alt-right movements do. They play on people's suffering, at times a struggle, and they feed off that misery and they build movements of hate. That's what happened in the Second World War. That's how we had a Holocaust during the Second World War. We need to have a real discussion about it. And, you know, you know, Elle, uh, you know, I, you were like right out there. But, you know, I agree with you. They are doing exactly what they were designed to do. And they are using left uh, struggles to, to, met, to pr provide messages for this movement. This is not uh, uh, an, an uprising for the working class. It's anti-worker, in fact. Like they took 1,500 people, uh, they, they, they closed down a mall, resulting in 1,500 people being unable to work. You have 4,800 cases in front of ESDC of truckers that have not been paid. This is not about workers. This is not about truckers this is about a rising uh, alt-right white supremacist movement that is well funded uh, by the united states the NDP called on investigating uh, gofundme where the money was coming from but let's get real gofundme was shut down they raised eight million dollars through a, a christian charity site so we've called for an investigation on that for a banning of hate symbols the fact that people were calling it a peaceful protest i don't think using uh, you know, flying Confederate flags and swastikas, um, you know, uh, harassing people in Winnipeg Centre, for example, in my riding where a convoy has has um, uh, uh, now sprung up that is right beside bus shelters where people live in minus 45, the only shelter for the for members of the unsheltered community now have blaring horns in their ears, including train horns. There is nothing peaceful about it. I find it deeply concerning that residents, for example, in my riding, uh, have called the non-emergency line about complaints about, you know, uh, about noise to be hung up on. Uh, and occupiers if, at the legislature talking about how they have, uh, I have it in quotes, we are in complete unity with them. I think Elle is right. I think they're doing exactly what they've been designed to do. And we are at a critical juncture. We have a moment to look honestly at systems and how systems that have been put in place to oppress. Let's not forget, and I've spoken about this in other panels, the reason we have an RCMP in this country was to remove violently Indigenous peoples off their land. That's why we have it. We have Wasoatan territory where they use sniper guns, where they literally use an axe and a chainsaw an axe and a chainsaw to break down the door of two peaceful women living out their rights on unceded territory, an axe and a chainsaw. Two people force normalized violence against Indigenous women and girls, and they can't figure out how to get uh, people to behave and, and not overtake a whole city. I've been in Ottawa 
uh, I live close to downtown. And it's not just the horns that drive you crazy. It's that visceral hate. It's that dangerous level of white supremacy. I'm proud that our, our party has called particularly for an investigation on where where this is being funded. We had Ted Cruz giving it a thumbs up, Donald Trump giving a thumbs up. If we narrow this conversation to just the Ottawa police, this is a bigger issue that we see brewing across the country. And it is a time of reckoning. And we can yeah. and we can choose to move forward in a way that that speaks truth to what's going on and develop systems that aren't going to to oppress people and be used to keep the most marginalized people in this country that have dealt with oppression down. So I, I have feel as passionately about Al about this. It was it was music to my ears. We, it's the time for real talk. Leah, yeah, um, just uh, in terms of the response from you know, officialdom in Ottawa, Parliament, the Prime Minister, um, at least it seemed to us from afar here on the West Coast, the response of the Prime Minister was really sort of very passive. Um, you know, he kind of disappeared for a while. I, I don't know how it played out in that emergency debate, but have you been surprised by the lack of proactivity by the government of Canada itself, personified by the prime minister and his government. They've been well, very slow to react. hundred percent. So we, you know, the prime minister has made a couple of speeches and then he's gone missing. Like, where's the leadership here? But, but we need leadership across the board. Uh, the fact that we have Pierre Polyev, who's come out as a, a conservative candidate, talking about, you know, picking up on the freedom convoy, talking about how he's going to fight for people's freedom, or the fact that Candace Bergen, the current uh, leader of the Conservative Party tried to compare uh, Indigenous people burning down churches after, after discovering uh, deceased children who were murdered in residential schools to what is going on uh, in, in the occupation in Ottawa. Um, that has been the discourse and that has been a normalized discourse, uh, whether it's now during the occupation or during the, the, since the colonization of this country, it's a normalized discourse that we really need to reconcile with. You know, we, we had uh, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. We say, there's no truth without justice. I'm going to uh, the first meeting of, of the inquest on I, a young Aisha Hudson, I, a 15 year old girl who was shot in the head by police in Winnipeg. Uh, the first the first day uh, of, of witnesses as, as we move into an inquest to support her family tomorrow. Excessive force, a, a force that was never really properly and get investigated to the point where they're calling for an, uh, an inquiry led by great legal minds like Murray Sinclair. This is not in our heads. And, and I think now is the time where we, I think more people are waking up to this I know, Al, before this, you spoke about your mom talking about defunding the police uh, people to really look at our systems and how, how, why our systems were designed in the first place and how they continue to perpetuate violence and how that violence is supported by people in power who priv are privileged from that violence. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for that, Leah. Uh, that's actually a really great segue. What you said about that this is um, about more than the police. So I want to actually go to, to David, but to, to, to pre premise this with um, so Ju Judy Rebek wrote an article in a rabbi, a rabbi, rabbi, where she was um, um, talking about the, like, the fact that uh, we have to understand why this is getting so much support. And she was critiquing both the, the gut that, that there's, there's legitimate critiques of the government response to the pandemic and legitimate critiques of the left's response to the pandemic and, and, and not supporting workers, that kind of stuff. So, so David, just this kind of a segue into the question to you, as our economist on the panel, what connections could or should we make between the events of the last two weeks in Ottawa and, up, and an upcoming federal budget with those critiques from Judy in mind? Yeah, I mean, certainly the upcoming budget will likely be later than budgets generally are, just given the pre-budget consultation timing. Uh, usually the, the MPs are interested in submissions for the budget uh, over the course of the late summer. Um, they're doing that actually right now. Uh, and so it's substantially later than you would usually do it. 
Um, usually the federal budget would be out uh, at the end of March, mid-March, early April, around March break uh, when students are out. Uh, it, it will likely be later in April, just given the timelines this year. And so if, uh, you know, it, it's unlikely that the budget will have any particular impact on it. Of course, the budget's a financial document. I mean, sometimes it's about policy, but it's often about financial pieces and how much new policies might cost. Um, and so it's tough to see how the federal budget would impact on this. I mean, that's it's probably two months away. I mean, I expect after two more months of occupation that something will happen. Um, you know, some of the ways the federal government is likely to see some sort of financial or give some financial support to this, um, well, to residents rather, I mean, not to the truckers, obviously, um, would be additional help for the businesses that are closed. Uh, you know, there are programs in place that were meant to support businesses during the pandemic. Um, they are much narrower now in focus uh, towards uh, tourism, food and hospitality businesses. And so actually many of the businesses that that have been closed down by the occupation uh, would likely still have access to these programs in the sense that they'd seen revenue fall and they're likely in these industries in any event. Um, but these have already been budgeted for us. So they're relatively minor. The workers uh, that are working downtown and missing uh, pay because they can't go to work, um, they would likely already be eligible for the lockdown benefit, which is a very small $300 a week amount um, that they could get if uh, they couldn't get EI. Uh, this is sort of a, you know, a, a serve afterthought uh, that's already in place. And Ottawa is so small, or the, the, the applicants are relatively small compared to the budget for this program that even if you did see more applicants from Ottawa, it probably wouldn't make that much difference, frankly, in the aggregate cost. I mean, the other thing that's, that, that is probable uh, is that uh, either the federal or provincial governments or both um, will support the cost to, uh, to, to, to the city of Ottawa of additional cops coming to Ottawa. Um, now, again, I mean, these are very minor amounts from the perspective of the federal government. I mean, this won't affect the federal government's deficit or debt or budget really in any way, just because it's so minor. Um, the, the issue here is not money. I mean, the issue here is leadership. And I mean, it, you know, it's also a question of, I was talking about this earlier, was, uh, you know, there will be large expenditures. I mean, from the perspective of the city, there'll be large expenditures on, on police for the occupation. Um, but I mean, the real question is is, 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 is more money the problem here? Like, is that the problem is that we just don't have enough money um, to end the occupation? Or is this about, you know, leadership and some vision of how laws actually apply to people, uh, as opposed to, you know, that, that applies, that apply evenly across different groups of people, as opposed to applying differently from, from one group to the other. Um, you know, that being said, this will be an important budget, uh, you know, it'll be the first budget after an election, even though that election seems like a long time ago. Um, there's a fair amount of negotiation that I expect is going to happen between the Liberals and one other party, potentially the NDP, maybe uh, Leah can give us a, a, a preview or insight into that. Um, there are substantial issues that continue to occur in Canada that require federal government intervention, um, besides the, the occupation in Ottawa. Um, you know, things like the backlog and surgery, extension of long-term care um, uh, standards across the country, rebuilding of our healthcare systems to make it more resilient against future waves of COVID-19. I mean, these are critical things that need to happen. Um, this, uh, you know, this occupation from a fiscal perspective is, is essentially irrelevant from the federal government's perspective. Um, but that doesn't say there's lots of important things in the budget. But I know this is more about the, the occupation than about other things. I, I'm interested, to, you know, this is just to throw it to other people, as I'm interested to hear, um, you know, whether, L, this is a fiscal problem. Is the problem that there isn't enough money going to the city of Ottawa and, and Ottawa police? Oh, well, that's the police argument. And, and, and Carl and I were talking about this beforehand, that no matter what the issue is, the police will always say they need more money. So the police are caught racially profiling people. Well, we need more money. We need to get more minority officers. The police are caught killing people. Well, we need more money. We need to train people. We need anti-bias training. The police are caught, um, I don't know, like not processing civilian complaints. Oh, we need more money. We need a civilian person. When I presented um, the report into defunding, the rhetoric the police started using was that we need police for hate crimes and sexual assault. And then the example they used and they showed their PowerPoint was how they helped a little black boy who went missing in North Preston. And it was very weaponized against me, right? As a black woman saying, here's a report that very 
um, specifically lays out the ways that we can very practically think about beginning to disinvest from the police, not just financially, but also ideologically in society, right? That we can have that shift into thinking in new ways about how we deal with social health, what is wellness, what is actual public safety? And they immediately went to like, well, what about hate crimes? Well, I don't know, but the convoy people have sent hate crime emails into my inbox and I don't see any police helping with that. So I think the police will always say that they need more money and they shift their rhetoric. If it's not black on black crime, then it's suddenly that they're helping us not, you know, now, now the police are somehow an anti-racist force, right? Um, so we know that the police are going to say that this is an example of why they need more personnel, but we know what their budget actually goes into. It goes into overtime salaries. 90% of the police budget goes into like salaries. It doesn't go into policing. Like, and again, so this shows us that it doesn't matter how much police you have, how much money is dumped on them, how many resources they have. They have far more resources than any other part of society because they have been the only part of society that has been radically resourced for decades. We've as you've talked about, we've defunded healthcare to the point that we don't even have emergency rooms that can handle COVID. We've defunded education. We've defunded you know, unions. We've defunded literally everything, some of which is what's leading to the crisis. And as Carl was talking about and Leah was talking about, this is where right-wing populism lives, right? This is where they take legitimate issues of social crisis and then push towards fascism. It's the immigrants that are the problem. It's the brown people that are the problem. Like That is always what right-wing populism rests upon. And so we've been seeing this very radical social shift, particularly since the 1970s, to completely disinvest from everything in public and then just use the police to fill the gaps. So what we're actually seeing, I would suggest, is not going to be solved by more money to police because more money to police continues the problem of disinvesting from collective social systems, which is why people are alienated, which is why people feel that government does nothing for them. And this is why we have these violent uprisings. It's why young people aren't voting because they're like, it doesn't make a difference what I vote for. Um, we talked in our report about participatory budgeting and returning budgets to the people, which doesn't really work on a federal level, obviously, but on a municipal level, there's many models where people get to say, hey, if we take this money from police, what in my community is actually keeping people safe? What is actually working? What programs are in my community and actually putting money there and reinvesting people in these systems? So I think we also have to think a lot about how disengaged we become from each other's society, how, uh, how we've normalized a completely violent state. And I don't just mean through policing. I mean, the violent loss of jobs, the loss of like of businesses. People are living very precarious lives. And if we're not careful, yes, it tips over into right-wing populism. So our yeah. job is to really make sure that we are advocating for money to go back to workers, to go back into unions, to go back into communities. And that means we have to stop spending it on the military and police. And we have to actually put it into economies of care instead. So Al, I'm gonna jump in there. And I think both you and David have made uh, a really good connection about how what's happening in Ottawa is connected to the budget. It is because the budget is about leadership, as you said, David, it is about making choices that is, you know, about the health and well-being of Canadians or not. Uh, and, and we're living the consequences of failed earlier budgets. And I'd like to bring in Carl now, because I of course we've got another element of this big story that's unfolding in Ottawa, and that is the resignation of um, Erin O'Toole, the now former leader of the Conservative Party. And Leah, you, you mentioned uh, Pierre Polyev, uh, uh, an Ottawa area member of parliament who's already announced his candidacy for the leadership of the Conservative Party. So Carl, you follow these things very closely. Um, the question, you know, what impact is Polyev going to have on the Conservative Party itself and on Canadian politics overall, given his history um, that's uh, very provocative in his politics? Um, is it a further indication, I guess, of sort of the radicalized conservative politics that we see taking place? So you talked about right wing populism. And, you know, if we look at the American model that we're seeing full blown and the full bloom, you have the, 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 the populist leader who seeks to get some justification from a notional democratic process, hugely flawed. And when the democratic process is, isn't necessarily or automatically going to give him power, 
he seeks to change the democratic process. So what they're doing in the states is seeking to corrupt the democratic process that's already pretty corrupt and corrupted even more to, to nullify the votes of millions of people or to prevent them from voting to make sure the right person gets elected. At the same time, if you look at the history of, I mean, another term for right-wing populism in Europe is fascism. That is, fascism started especially in the country that gave birth to that name, Italy, uh, Mussolini was a socialist at one time. And what they do and what Polyev's strategy will be is to have a two-pronged strategy to intimidate the forces of so-called moderate democratic bourgeois order, if we can use old-fashioned language, with activities like the activities they're seeing in Ottawa in the streets, and then to, and then to seek legitimately elected state power through the electoral process. But it is two-pronged. Whether it'll work in Canada, I'm not sure. I mean, many people say to me, oh, Polyev is too extreme and they'll never, they'll never ever, he'll never ever win. But people said that about Trump as well. Uh, they said he's too extreme, he's too ridiculous. The Democrats tried to manipulate things so they'd get Trump as an opposition, think they'd have an e thinking they'd have an easy win and it backfired on them. So, uh, but I think Polyev, in, in supporting, he, uh, he supported these, these uh, invaders into Ottawa and in supporting this sort of th stuff. I mean, Polyev, in fact, his one personal history as a, as a minister in the Harper government was to try to dampen the vote. He was involved in mm -hmm. something called the Fair Elections Act, where he tried to prove well, the whole purpose was a very American style effort to prevent people from voting. So he, he obviously can't do that. I mean, we have to give the Liberals some credit. They got rid of most of those noxious provisions and opened up the process somewhat. But the the uh, the point the point about Polyev is that it is an alliance similar to Trump, where the 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 right has now discovered that we we have to Im mimic the early twentieth century fascists. We have to have forces in the streets. We can't abandon the streets. Um, to, to the progressives and to the left. We have to take over the streets. And when we take over the streets, we don't have banners saying what we stand for. We have banners that say F blank, 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 Trudeau. And we have the, you know, the Confederate and the Nazi flags and we have aggress. It's all about aggression. It's all about anger. It's not about proposing policies or suggesting how you want to make society better. And then, and it works. I mean, we can see a police chief in Ottawa who is genuinely afraid of? I find all the politicians are afraid of that, including Trudeau. The way he t today walking into Parliament into question period, they tried they try to ask him what would happen. You know, Doug Ford had just slapped him in the face, saying he wouldn't take part in a tripartite federal municipal um, uh, provincial meeting to discuss this issue. And Trudeau said, "Well, I talked to Premier Ford on the telephone," and and he just sort of slunk into into Parliament. And all the all the politicians could say is, well, they, they better leave. You know, they better leave. We want these people to leave. Now, it's problematic because if you take Elle's point of view, we citizens should go and push them away. But I think the people of Ottawa are saying, yes, uh, over the long term, we should seek to defund the police and change the orientation of society um, from policing to something else. But in the short term, they'd like to find somebody uh, to defend the people of Ottawa and and to prevent, again, to go back to the European example, when Mussolini marched on Rome illegally, and 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 burnt burnt farms and burnt houses on the way, he was he was prime minister shortly after that. They they the elected they made him the the head of the elected government, even though he had only a few members of the Italian Parliament. So I mean, we could end up. These people are threatening the actual order, the actual democratic order. They're terrifying the more moderate, the more meek uh, uh, Democrats. And Polyev stands to be their uh, their partner in the electoral process. And we should hey, not Carl, care gonna, about that. I'm going to jump in there because I think uh, your last comment there actually leads us into the questions that are beginning to come in. There's lots of questions coming in. And one of them that's been raised uh, in the chat is that... Uh, uh, you know, racialized Canadians are accustomed to the uh, the reality that we cannot rely on the police to come to our aid, um, and and so that this person is wondering um, that 
a lot of the outrage of the convoy is coming from the fact that many white Canadians in Ottawa are experiencing this kind of reality for the first time. So the question is, is it possible that the convoy will actually advance a sense of equality by giving white Canadians a glimpse of the reality endured by racialized Canadians? Any, any response to that question from any of you? Well, I, I you know, I, I certainly uh, hope so. Uh, but um, I think, you know, there's, there's a, a, a really a huge issue here. It, it really, for me, uh, is a time of reckoning. Uh, Monday is the day of remembrance for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Uh, over 5,000 gone murdered and missing with little or no action, something that's been noted by the UN. Uh, this is not new. This is this is this is reality that has been faced by uh, BIPOC uh, individuals. Um, you know, this is the this is not just faced. Uh, going back, let's remember the reason why we have police in this country was to impose a violent colonial agenda to forcefully remove Indigenous peoples off their lands. So I think we have to go beyond, uh, like you know, moments of empathy to really look at complete system change uh, to to move forward in a different way. It's uh, do I think it's possible? Sure, I do. I mean, like the TRC, for example, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think it's opened up uh, dialogue in this country that never would have happened if we didn't have a Truth and Reconciliation report. Yeah. But how slow has the government been to act? Well, it's, it still hasn't it still hasn't implemented um, all the calls to action. Uh, they weren't calls to discussion. I think this is uh, if there was ever a time where we are forced to act. I think it's now. Yep. Thanks, Leah. And another question here that sort of makes a connection back to the upcoming federal budget. So I'll I'll throw this one out to you, David. Um, the person is saying that they're concerned that the upcoming budget will focus on ways to bring us back to you know, the old normal, whatever that is, um, and, and not apply some of the lessons that we've learned uh, regarding working people from this pandemic, for example, wages for the service sector that are still currently um, at the poverty level or ensuring quality care for workers and those living in home care. So obviously a lot of concern about you know, if the federal budget just sort of continues on as though nothing has really changed and there's no, you know, these big earth shaking events aren't happening all around us. Yeah, I mean, you know, and in many ways we, we have gone back, you know, when we take a look at worker supports uh, when workers lose their jobs. I mean, we're back to not not entirely, but very close back to sort of a 2019 EI system at this point. Uh, with some exceptions. I mean, the big lesson that we learned at the start of the pandemic was the value of a simple accessible benefit like the CERB that completely replaced the EI system in the early months of the pandemic at uh, $500 a week. Uh, they created a, you know, an adequate floor on incomes for people so they could look for other jobs. And we saw a lot of job movement out of the food and accommodation sector, which was hit particularly hard in the first couple of waves of the pandemic into other sectors. People got other jobs. Uh, and no small part that was likely due to the fact that they could access a simple benefit um, like the CERB that was a flat amount, that was a fair amount more than they would have gotten on EI. Um, and uh, as a result, they, you know, they, they could find other work. And this is you know, one of the benefits of these types of, of, of uh, supports. I mean, that has uh, been wheeled away. We're back to 55% of previous earnings, which for most Canadians on EI will be in the neighborhood of $300 a week. Um, you know, they're for self-employed workers um, that they had almost continuous coverage until October through various programs, although it also had been whittled back to $300 a week. Uh, and then from October through the start of the new year, there was nothing for, for um, uh, self-employed workers until the new lockdown benefit, which itself seemed like, a, like an afterthought that wasn't at all ready for Omicron or wasn't at all ready to actually support workers in lockdown. And so they rushed to, to get that out the door. And in essence, then everybody in the country now is at you know, was was eligible for the lockdown benefit, also three hundred dollars a week. Um, so it, 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 you know, this was meant to be very specific to geography, but that was all thrown out the window because that was a terrible idea in the first place. Now, I, you know, I, and it's unfortunate that we that we haven't learned these lessons. The the federal government uh, swoops into the EI system in times of recession, uh, and then swoops back out again 
in better times. This is actually somewhat unusual. I mean, it, it's actually in, in other EI systems, employment insurance systems, it's not just workers and employers that contribute to it, it's also governments. And so, I mean, you know, we do this alternative federal budget every year and we look at, uh, you know, what are some improvements, practical improvements we could have in the EI system that allows more workers into the system who've paid into it, but uh, aren't securely employed enough to get enough hours to get in the door. Uh, you know, how, how, would, how would we allow them in? You know, how do we lower the hours requirement? How do we create a floor at $500 a week? Um, how do we boost uh, the coverage rate um, higher up? Um, and one of the ways that we pay for that is to, have the, is to have the federal government as one of the contributors to the EI system. Yeah. Um, now, EI is, uh, helps people who have an, an attachment to the labor force. They have employment earnings. And one of the reasons why people live in poverty is they don't have employment earnings. That's the problem, right? Uh, they can't work uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, they themselves are ill. There's, you know, someone in their family is ill. Um, you know, someone won't give them a shot. They live with disability and someone won't give them a shot, won't give them the proper supports. Um, and so this isn't about the EI system. It's about building a better income transfer system that supports Canadians that aren't seniors and don't have children. Uh, this is one of the big gaps in Canada in terms of income supports. If you're a senior, you do have access to a, a basic income through the old age security and guaranteed income supplements. If you're a family with children, you have access to a basic income via the, the Canada Child Benefit. Um, those could certainly be higher, but they exist. Uh, if you're a Canadian with disabilities or you're an adult that isn't in those first two groups, you have essentially no support from the federal government. Um, and your primary support, if you uh, if you live in poverty, is likely social assistance, um, and all of the uh, you know all of the issues that go along with that. Yeah. This could be improved, and so I mean, this is one of the things in our alternative federal budget is we could have a Canada livable income that provides a basic income for adults. We could have a um, uh, a national disabilities program, uh, Canadian uh, disability benefit that provides a basic floor and in incomes of eleven thousand dollars for Canadians with disabilities. Um, you know, it's it's costed out in the alternative budget. I mean, these aren't this isn't pie in the sky. We're proposing practical things that could be put into place. Um, and so, I mean, I think these are important pieces of the puzzle in terms of supporting Canadians. Um, you know, not only in future waves, but in future crises when uh, you know when they're hit with job loss or they just live in 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 low income. They live in poverty. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the alternative federal budget that the CCPA and many other groups work on together because it does show that there are. Um, realistic and affordable and achievable elements of the federal budget that can actually help um, Canadians overall, working people, um, elders. Um, and so that's something that I think is very present of mind. Uh, we've also talked today about the rise of right-wing populism and how radicalized conservative politics is, and it's now being further enabled by the players within the conservative party itself. And I think one other element of that, and it comes up in a question here, is how that impacts our healthcare system. Um, and, you know, are there, do you have concerns that we're gonna see further uh, rallying calls for privatization of healthcare, right? You know, the healthcare system's broken. Well, we know there's been structural problems for more than a decade. Uh, when I was the health critic in Ottawa for the NDP, I mean, we were screaming and yelling from the rooftops about the problems that there were with the healthcare system not being properly resourced. Of course, now through a pandemic, that has um, shown itself to be an enormous crisis, uh, but it, it's playing, it could play into the right wing call for privatization, uh, which would be a huge threat to our publicly funded, accessible, universal, universal healthcare system. So just any, any comments from any of you on that in terms of how that's playing out in the political scene as it begins to unfold with the federal budget and the ongoing pandemic? I mean, I, I, one of the real problems the provinces are going to have is that the feds bailed them out on this. Like the transfers from the federal government to the provinces over the course of the pandemic have been uh, really, uh, you know, awesome. I mean, they, they have been, uh, you know, truly massive transfers from the federal to the provincial governments uh, with the, you know, with, with 86% of all of the money spent on the pandemic across business, employment supports, healthcare, childcare. 86 cents of that was a federal dollar, you know, as 86 cents was federal and uh, only 14% of that expenditure was provincial. Uh, and what that is going to allow provincially is there are surpluses on the horizon across the board at the provincial level. Uh, if not this year, then next year, 
Uh, and so I think one of the big problems is provincially is that you can't argue that the cupboard is bare because the cupboard isn't bare. The cupboard is full because the feds went down there and stuffed it with money. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hope that for advocates at the provincial level, um, this is useful that the cupboard is not bare. I mean, usually deficits are used as a bludgeon to, uh, you know, to, to not implement programs that should be implemented that, that Canadians need, uh, you know, maybe because you don't want to raise revenues. Uh, in this case, that's not, not going to be the case. In most provinces, we'll see surpluses in the next two years. Okay, hey, Robin, I'm going to turn it back over to you to follow up on some of the other questions that have come in. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Olivia. Actually, um, the, uh, so a number of the questions we've talked about are focusing on the budget and um, support for workers. I actually want to link it back to, um, again, uh, uh, to Judy Ribbick's article, because I think she's on, on here, because Certainly the way we've been framing this so far is uh, in terms of the, the, the back to the, um, the convoy is that the, the, these folks are kind of all a bunch of crazies, and whatever, but obviously it's more complex than that. And I want to, so in, in Judy's article, she says, it is appealing to dismiss the flu trucks clan convoy as an assemblage of the fringes that needn't be taken seriously. But this mobilization provides one of the few outlets for many people to visibly express anger and frustration around legitimate grievances with the government failures during the pandemic. And she crit crit critiques the government and the left, including the NDP. So I'd be curious to hear people's uh, thoughts on that. Well, I think one of the problems with that is this isn't new. White grievance politics always gets legitimacy. White people don't have jobs. Oh my God, well, they just have to vote for Trump as if black people don't have two to three times the unemployment and we're not fascists as a result, right? So I think we have to look at how, first of all, white grievance politics is always given all this here. Remember, who was it? Uh, John Ibbotson or someone that wrote that article in the Globe and Mail about how we really have to take Maxime Bernier seriously because he might do violence to us if we don't. And as if that's a legitimate form of political discourse, like, oh, this white person might kill you, so guess you should give them airspace, right? And this is always how white rage gets treated. And we have to be honest about that. We also have to be honest about the fact that it's not like black women and indigenous women aren't organizing. Like we're not sitting on our couches going and being out organized by the right. We're not white men, like we're not. So all the organizing we do just isn't seen as legitimate, whether that's us writing a well-sourced report like or whatever it is. So I think we have to not necessarily bow down to the side of the left is never organizing. We are organizing all the time. It's just when we do it, we're not given the same legitimacy in the media. We're called woke activists, right? And we're dismissed. And then, and I think we also have to recognize the very same people that have such a grievance about showing, you know, their vaccine passport at Boston Pizza have no problem with us being police checked. It's not like they've been out here being against racial profiling and they're like, and I'm also against vaccine passports. Like, I'm cool if the police are on the block in your community. I just don't want to show a piece of paper. So there's no solidarity there. So I do think in some ways we have to reject the tendency that I think we have on the left to always come so hard on the left and be like, we're failing in all these ways. Look at the right as if they always occupy this legitimate airspace. With that said, yes, organizing is always what we need to be doing. We need to fight the atomizing of organizing on the left into like we can organize as racial group. Like I'm proud of being a black person. I wanna organize the black community, but we also need to make sure we're doing that in solidarity with different movements. We need to be making sure that we're reaching out. I don't think it's very productive to just dismiss people because many, many people shift the people move from being you know, uh, in the center to moving left, being on the right to the left. Like we can't give up on the idea that people are lost causes. We have to be going out and talking to people. We have to be organizing. We have to be strengthening unions. We really have to be talking about workers' issues. And that is work that we can do all the time in our communities, whether that's organizing, organizing like tenancy groups, whether that's doing the mutual aid that we did do in COVID, where we were getting each other's groceries and making sure that people had a way to get to appointments. You know, we have the tools to do this. So I also think we shouldn't buy into despair on the left to this idea that we're not doing anything on the left. We are doing things, but we need to continue to strengthen those things. And there is very much has been, of course, a very neoliberal discourse that wants to focus on like EDIA or something without focusing on liberation, right? And we need to be working towards freedom, real freedom, and not letting, you know, this discourse of freedom that's I'm a hero in a Rambo movie be co-opted into the real freedom of people to freely move, to freely live because we can pay our rent, to freely be able to take work or not take work, 
to have childcare. These are the elements of real freedom in society. And yes, we need to strengthen that. We always do. But I also really object to this idea that we always kind of bow down and pretend that only the right is organizing and the left is just sitting around like picking our noses because that's not true. It's just we're not given the same airspace and legitimacy and, and like, oh, like our grievances. Our grievances are wokeness, right? And then white grievances are real grievances that are legitimate. So, you know, I think we also have to reject that discourse. Uh, thank you. Now, before somebody answers, I just said, uh, Judy Rebick has asked me to correct the fact that she co-wrote that article with Corvin Russell. So I want to throw that in there. But, uh, anybody else? Well, I just, I mean, oh, sorry. Well, I just ahead, wanted to, you go ahead. Yeah, Leo. sorry. I just wanted to say, uh, bravo, uh, Al. Um, that was just, you know, it's it's quite a life here in, in Ottawa. And I have to say that was uh, pretty refreshing for me in terms of that real talk. Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, you were talking about freedoms. That's one of the reasons why I've put forward a bill, uh, Bill C-233 uh, in support of a guaranteed livable, mm -hmm. a basic income. Uh, you know, you want to talk about freedom. You want to talk about people that have been excluded. Uh, if, if we haven't learned that in the pandemic, I mean, really, I mean, artists, I mean, I spoke about it the last time. Uh, I think that's an essential service. I, I would have died without music, films, uh, art. Uh, many artists uh, are, are starving. People with complex mental health and trauma. People, people who are doing unpaid care work, mostly, mostly by women. Uh, you know, that is work. That needs to be honored and that needs to be paid. And this kind of neoliberal idea about what, it, what accounts for real work and not real work. Like we need to move beyond feudalism and we need to just make sure that people can have what they need to thrive and not just survive. And, you know, go into, move into systems of real care uh, where people have uh, what they need. I mean, a lot of the anger that, that you see for people that are in the convoy um, has to do with people losing incomes, people losing homes, uh, people feeling, uh, people feeling uh, like they've been forgotten by the government. I mean, it, you know, I think it's a good solution to a lot of this. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I think this is well funded. It's actually if we actually support people um, in a in a proper way, uh, our systems are not working. EI is archaic. Uh, even even the Ca Child Canada uh, benefit uh, is is racist. Uh, we know, depending on immigration status, there's even many families that live in Canada that don't even get that benefit. We need to change systems to make sure that that all people are looked after. So I thought, you know, I know this. We're talking about the convoy, but I wanted to do a shameless plug on my bill, and uh, you know, direct people to my website, leahgazan.ca/basic-income. Good. Um, and I think I think we're just about to wrap up with Robin. And I think, Carl, um, you could a very short comment, 30 seconds or less. You had you wanted to weigh in on this last question. Uh, sh I don't think it's a shameless uh, uh, plug for your bill. It's a totally legitimate. It's a very absolutely it's very worthwhile. But all I would say is that to take it back to where we started, which is with this occupation, occupation of Ottawa and of the blocking of the bridges. What is scary here and what I don't I, I grapple with is that if we look at it, I often look at history and write about history and look at history in the broad perspective. The right is ruthless, aggressive, without scruples, without principles, and never and, and never stops to be nice. And I'm not saying that those people, progressive people are necessarily nice or too nice, but they are being utterly ruthless now and they're scaring the mushy middle, and they've got their nice allies. We had the conservative leader pretending to say, oh, pack up your bags and go home. Pack up your bags and go home, folks. And at the same time, uh, she said, but I support absolutely everything you, you're suggesting and I'm proposing the government completely capitulate to you and do everything you're demanding. So this is really uh, a scary situation because essentially, these people have proven if you want to intimidate a society, uh, you don't have to come with uh, weapons. You, you, you're only, the only weapon you need is an internal combustion engine in an enormous, huge vehicle, and you can act with impunity. And mm -hmm. I think that is a scary situation. My Thank wife said much, 30 though. seconds. You did well. <laughs> um, 
So that's all the time we have for questions for, day, for today. Um, the, uh, just before I wrap up, actually, I do want to throw out one statistic that relates to what, L, what we've all been talking about in terms of out of control police budgets and our police force here in Ottawa that has been failing to address this. And that is that the city of Ottawa recently launched its uh, consultations for its anti-racism strategy and the entire budget for the anti-racism strategy is $100,000. The 2022 dry cleaning budget for the Ottawa Police Service is $495,000. Um, thanks to our audience members for their excellent questions. Uh, rest assured that we will have future discussions on the fallout from the Freedom Convoy and the upcoming federal budget. Uh, thanks so much to our panelists, Al Jones, Leah Gazan, David McDonald, and Carl Nuremberg, and to my co-host, Libby Davies. Uh, Off the Hill will be back uh, March 10th. Be sure to sign up for Rabble's newsletter at rabble.ca slash alerts to make uh, sure you get the invitation. And finally, uh, thank you to Rabble for creating a space uh, to host these important discussions. As always, we encourage uh, you all to help Rabble out by becoming a monthly donor at rabble.ca slash donate. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you March 10th. Uh, mark it in your calendars. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night.